Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dr. Deep State. Today we have a very special guest with us from Vonday Radio. This is Peter Gumley, and we are going to talk about empire today. I am going to switch over to Will Tucker for the rest of our introduction. Um, but Will and I found this when we were uh, new into doing our deep dive into Catholicism, and we fell in love with the channel um, Vende Radio, a true preserver of the faith, and uh, in short, he is not a limited hangout. So I'm going to bring it over to you, Will, right now. Peter Gumley is a contributing editor of the traditionalist web journal 1 Peter 5. His writing has also appeared in Crisis, the Catholic Herald, and the European Conservative. In addition to his work as a journalist and commentator, Mr. Gumley is the host of Vonde Radio, a podcast that focuses on the crisis in the church, the left and right wings of the deep state, JQ, Catholic Integralism, the Scandemic hoax, and its ensuing medical tyranny. Recently, Mr. Gumley has appeared on the E. Michael Jones and Tim Kelly podcasts, as well as hosting interviews with Bishop Williamson and our uh, recent guest, Thaddeus Kaczynski. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. It's an honor to be on Dr. Deep State. I've gained a lot from your broadcasts. Excellent. Before you begin, Peter, if I had to say what we're, Will and I are up to right now in pursuit of the metaverse, it's sort of uh, Days of Noah meets Vende Radio, and it's a strange <laughs> mixture. But please tell us what you are up to with your research. Yeah, I, I've been... Um, pondering a few things. Um, and I, I, I should point out that uh, one of the stimuli for uh, these reflections were actually uh, one of your excellent um, broadcasts, Dr. Haugen, um, from I think quite early on in the Dr. Deep State uh, oeuvre, um, the presentation Reflections on US Education. I could tell um, being in education myself, some of the inputs uh, that had gone in there and, and clearly a you know, a, a lifetime of um, immersion in in uh, secondary and tertiary education. And uh, I think uh, in that uh, presentation, you talk about some of the, um, what I call the precepts of empire, some of the prerogatives of those that rule, those that govern. Um, I guess it's, it's easy for people today, particularly of my generation, younger generations to feel rather jaded and to come over very postmodern. Um, and it, this is a kind of, uh, I guess, a balance that needs to be struck because uh, just recently, um, a mutual friend, um, Daniel Olesson, uh, was asking me, well, what, what are the Aristotelian four causes? Hey, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> As an example, uh, he asked, what, what are the Aristotelian four causes of democracy? And uh, I, I, we started discussing, okay, the material causes, the, the demos and the, um, the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the formal cause is suffrage and uh, jury participation. Uh, and the final cause is um, equality and the, the common good. And then I just had to stop myself and say, no, the, the, the final cause is um, uh, concealing oligarchy. Uh, in, in de facto historical concrete terms, that's actually what democracy uh, as retailed uh, actually um, entails today. And so it's very easy to, to become very cynical <laughs> with, the, with these postmodern glasses. But I, I think what's perhaps helped with this reading of um, current affairs and also of history is uh, reading St. Augustine's City of God um, I must confess, for the first time uh, recently uh, as part of my Lenten reading, I think it's um, absolutely essential for any person that's going to um, consider themselves, uh, you know, a, a scholar of Catholic history. Uh, this is the, the, the proper lens of Catholic history uh, that is applied. And so um, I think maybe where we can, uh, what we can discuss to begin with is the idea of Romanitas, and uh, this idea of a particularly Roman nature of uh, Christianity. Um, and then we can juxtapose this perhaps with what you mentioned in your reflections on US education, 
the Washington consensus um, and how it's no secret that the founding fathers were largely inspired to create a new Rome. Uh, one only needs yeah. to look at the edifices, the architecture of Washington, D.C. to to see that. So um, I think I think that's the first thing to look at, you know, what because Christians quite rightly can uh, be wary of the trappings of worldly power and and the 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 magnificence of um the roman empire and and indeed the the roman catholic church uh but this is this is uh very much in the tradition of roman catholic political thought uh as channeled and transmitted by saint augustine um and i think we should go first of all to uh the statue in nebuchadnezzar's dream in the uh, book of daniel uh which which uh appears to uh, the, the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar um, as um, a statue of, of uh, mixed elements. First of all, with a head of gold, uh, with chest and arms of silver, and then uh, belly and thighs of bronze, legs, thigh, uh, thighs then, well, uh, yeah, thighs and, and of iron and legs of iron, which then become mingled with clay to become feet of of uh, of clay, and um, eventually a stone uh, strikes the statue and, and breaks it into pieces. Um, now this is all very mysterious, um, and this is what the fifth monarchy men were referring to uh, with regard to uh, the, the 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 five kingdoms here uh, of of world history, the five hegemons, five empires. So um, there is pretty much consensus among the church fathers with regard to their exegesis of uh, this statue. Um, and so I think as, as Catholics, we can have confidence as to what sort of understanding we should have uh, with regard to this, this vision. Um, I think all of them other than Ephraim the Syriac uh, agree that the, the head of gold represents the, the kingdom of Babylon uh, the chest and arms of silver is the empire of Persia, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's own, uh, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon. Um, chest and arms of silver, Persia, which is then replaced by uh, the bronze belly of uh, the kingdom, the empire of Macedon, the empire of Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic world. The Iron Kingdom is... Uh, identified with the kingdom of Rome, the incredibly strong kingdom that will not break and will dominate the earth, which then uh, flows down into these mingled feet of iron and clay, which uh, have their, uh, uh, the interpretation is that, as, that at least St. Jerome gives, is that this is the mingling of the barbarians with the Roman Empire, which was happening in his own time. Uh, and then, um, medieval Catholic um, uh, thinkers have given this a further um, interpretation in, and speculated that the ten toes represent ten nations or ten democracies even that will emerge from the, the Iron Kingdom. Um, but I'm going to submit that in a certain sense we are still in, in the mingled state at the moment. And uh, that is the particularly Roman stamp, the Romanitas which isn't just incidental to Christianity, it is uh, essential. Um, the stone that strikes the statue, breaks into pieces, um, is the um, the parousia, the end of the world, the eschaton, um, and the, the end of earthly empires. And so what is this? What it, wh why did St. Peter make this decision to go to the very heart of the imperium of the civil power which had put to death his master. Um, you know, modernists are kind of just make it seem almost like accidental history. He liked central Italian cuisine. Um, it, it was, it had very good uh, transport um, networks uh, and, and uh, communication. But when we think about the, the daring of that act, that he went right, and, and St. Paul indeed, uh, went right to the heart of that empire, um, we, can, we can understand that he was following there what um, our Lord says in the book of Acts to, um, um, 
the uh, the disciple. Um, what's his name in Damascus? Is it Barnabas? My, I'm just drawing a blank here, but I think it's Barnabas. And he he says to receive. Uh, sorry, Ananias. He says to receive Saint Paul, uh, for he is my vessel of election. Uh, or who will carry uh, my my name to the Gentiles and to their kings, he says. So our Lord wants Catholic kings. Uh, indeed, in the Great Commission, he says, um, go forth and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So he wants Catholic nations. He wants Catholic kings. Uh, God wills that all men be saved, uh, including emperors and kings. And so there must be a holy way of uh, of Christian government. Um, so, what is this? Uh, how does this connect with uh, Romanitas? Well, um, again, when we consider our Lord's uh, conflict with the temporal authorities, with the Pharisees, um, we have the parable of the wicked tenants in Matthew twenty one, uh, where the um, the householder plants a vineyard and uh, uh, withdraws to um, a strange country. And then the husbandmen uh, conspire, lay hands on his servants, uh, beat one and then kill another, stone another until the the far the um, the uh, the farmer uh, sends his son uh, thinking this is my heir. Um, uh, they won't uh, they won't harm him. And then the servants lay their hands on his son uh, and kill him, conspire to take his inheritance. And when the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those husbandmen? And in the uh, the chief priests, the Pharisees say to him, they, he will bring those evil men to an evil end and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen that shall render him the fruit in due season. And uh, Jesus saith to them, um, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. By the Lord has this been done and is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and shall be given to a nation yielding the fruit thereof. Um, and then it says, and then and when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that he spoke of them. And again, the um, traditional exegesis of this passage is that the nation he is referring to is the nation of Rome. Um St. Augustine himself is, is nervous about identifying Rome too strongly um, as uh, the, the city of God. In fact, of course, the city of God is a, a great uh, analysis of the, all the ways in which pagan Rome had fallen. Um, but nevertheless, in, his, uh, in the previous century, there had been the conversion of Constantine. And we, we saw a gradual Christianization of the empire, which I would say uh, reached its summit in um, the Holy Roman Empire and the coronation of Charlemagne um, and the thousand years of the Holy Roman Empire that uh, followed um, that particular um, event. So um, those are some of my initial thoughts. Uh, interested uh, what, what that's prompted uh, on your part. Well, do you want to Jump in quickly, maybe um, one thing that comes to my mind is is um, Buck's analysis is of how the, the the Catholic social order, the sacred symbolic economy was actually put in and it inverted the logic of paganism um, through the more the emperor submitted himself. And this would be, again, like. Moses coming down, all must submit. The more the emperor would submit to this metaphysical reality of his own kingship or his own emperorness, <laughs> his empire, the more he submitted, the more he was given. It was an inversion of the reality, the, you know, uh, the will to power reality. Um, and I don't think people quite grasp that. There's a couple other comments I should have, sorry. I, <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna, do you wanna, sorry, Will, jump on in please. Uh, no, I, I was just saying that's fine. Um, yeah, I was also thinking about the added element of, you know, the, the rebellion against Julius Caesar uh, that's happening almost, you know, cont contemporary with our Lord's um, sacrifice and this, this uh, tension between the Republic and, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the monarchy or the, uh, you know, the, the kingship of, 
of Rome and these two tensions of of, of legal forms um, that are that are playing out uh, within the structure of the Roman Empire. Yeah, and let me jump in one more time. It, there is a paradox, you know, because reality is paradoxical, Christ is paradoxical, the decision to be in Rome, I think is paradoxical. Uh, the two legs are paradoxical. Some have said it's the East and the West, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it as much as I used to. But one thing, and I don't know where to go with this because there is sort of this, whether from the secular world or from uh, Christian historians, there is this, what you know, Vatican II would call the hermeneutic of continuity with the story of Rome. If you ever run into Pocock's work, the Machiavellian moment, which I highly recommend understanding what it is, because I'm still getting my head around, it's been a few years, but what the Roman or what the American project was, was not so much a continuity, but it went back and took, it, it took that sacred economy out of context and rebuilt it in its own guise of an empire. So I think it's a counterfeit empire of sorts, America. In other words, it's metaphysically, um, Machiavelli's view is the, the, the transcendent power of the emperor would be horizontalized. So in a republic form, you could put it into a battery or a circuit. And that's precisely what the scientists, the framers of America were doing, according to the book Empire. And so there's two kind of fascinating storylines that kind of overlap on each other and, and maybe sometimes become the same storyline. And I don't mean to problematize your story, but I mean, these are things that, are, that I'm wrestling with right now as well. <clears throat> Peter. Yeah, it is paradoxical and it is intention. Because as you say, for all its evils and um, pathologies that it spreads throughout the world, the American empire remains in a certain sense, the bearer of the scepter of the West in God's providential care of, uh, of uh, humanity today. It is the, what desiccated though it is, it is uh, the, the bearer of that Christian uh, that 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 uh, legacy of Christian civilization, in a certain sense, in a very very attenuated sense, uh, it is. And were world hegemony to pass to China, uh, you know, well, Russia is a different matter, but China certainly, uh, that would be a, a very very significant moment uh, for for that sector to be uh, transferred. But there is a tension, and I think Pope uh, Leo the Great, Pope Saint Leo the Great. Um, helps to resolve this a little bit when he he describes how uh, just as um, Romulus and Remus founded the the pagan uh, Roman city, which indeed the founders were looking to reconstitute. Uh, so uh, St. Peter and St. Paul founded the spiritual city of Rome and baptized the pagan city, were both martyred on the same day, but established the um the supreme pontificate in rome where it has remained as a uh as a fulfillment uh, as a guarantor of christ's promise uh, ever since in the last two millennia um saint augustine as well i i find is helpful in this regard he talks about the nature of civil power and begins by taking cicero's definition of the people uh, of a republic as a multitude united in association by a community of interest and a common sense of right, uh, the Roman, the Latin jus. Um, and Augustine continues, there can be no jus without justitia. There can be no right without righteousness, which is to render to each one his due, uh, to recall Socrates' definition. And of course, the first one to whom Yus is due is Almighty God, since he is the creator, sustainer and perfecter of all things. Yeah. And the Yus, as we know from divine revelation, due to Almighty God is true worship in the manner that he has ordained, which is the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ represented at the Catholic altar of the Holy Mass. Uh, and St. Augustine's very um, direct conclusion is that there is no justice. There can be no justice, therefore, save in that republic whose founder and ruler is Christ. And of course, this is the original sin of the American Republic to not establish that holy sacrifice um, at its very uh, heart in its constitution to establish Correct. 
re uh, religious indifferentism. Uh, to be the first European uh, nation since the incarnation to ignore the fact that God has entered history, to not even establish a Protestant uh, cultus, um, bespeaks the project of the serpent, the project of man as God, as man um, participating in history, uh, in the becoming. So for Augustine, a temporal polity derives its legitimacy from its insertion into this order of true worship, which is universal and supranational, the city of God, the res publica Christiana, or Christ's church. And I'm going to suggest those are two facets really of the same thing. And without the just worship of the holy mass at the heart of the civil order, a baptized liturgical polity with the right uh, economy of image, as you've been thinking about, Will. Any given city, according to St. Augustine, will degenerate into a latrocinium, uh, a brigandage, a community of thieves and robbers united in, in association by a common agreement on the objective of their brigandage. In other words, a division of the loot. And St. Augustine speaks approvingly of the reply given to Alexander the Great by a pirate that he had captured. The pirate is asked by the king what he meant by keeping hostile possession of the sea. And the man responds, uh, what you mean by seizing the whole earth. But because I do it with a petty ship, I am called a robber, while you who does it with a great fleet are styled emperor. It's the will to power. It's the uh, attempt to create Babylon, that figure of the city of man, of the blockchain of the serpent, by, in our time, technology, the will to power. Um, so I, I believe that that is the, the dominant, uh, spirit in, in our, um, period of empire. And we've, we've been through this process of the great apostasy of the European nations, um, that's seen this, uh, this slow degeneration into the latrocinium and those brigands, um, every politician, all they're willing to talk about is GDP, material comfort. Uh, the the economic um, accumulation of of wealth um, makes us, of course, uh, gives us over to the lords of the earth, the merchants, the money power, and we can talk about you know who's behind that money power, but perhaps it's the people that our Lord spoke about uh, who killed the the sons of the uh, of the Lord of the Vineyard. Mm. Yes. Well, Will, would you yeah. like to jump in? Sure. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, you know, this image of the mingling of the iron and the miry clay suggests also this um, like alchemical uh, aspect of mixture, but it's a it seems to suggest that this mixture is impossible. It's an aspiration. It can't be conceived in reality. So um, this uh, and also you know the rejected cornerstone uh, that becomes the yeah that becomes the centerpiece. Uh, it suggests that, you know, each of these subsequent hegemonies are built upon the rubble of the previous one. So likewise, this new Babylon, um, this new world order, or new Atlantis will have to be built on the rubble of the existing Holy Roman Empire. Um, and this process of alchemical mixture in which the typologies, the, the uh, you know, the the structure of, and the ontology of the existing order has to be recaptured, uh, you know, deconstructed and recaptured into this this new project. So, um, yeah, where, where political sovereignty doesn't subject itself to spiritual authority or the, the social kingship of Christ, as we call it, um, uh, where theology isn't the queen over physical, economic, and political sciences, it surrenders to dead idols. In the, this case the economic power, finance, banking power um, steps in to become the sovereignty that's invisible, as you say. Uh, you know, democracy by its by its very nature undermines itself where it can't self-constitute. It requires some guarantor, as you've said, uh, uh, some some sovereign that's outside of its its circle that can maintain the limit, that can maintain, you know, what's inside the law and what's outside the law, as we've talked about over and over again. And so, um, uh, you know, what Doug was talking about this uh, state of the um, the pagan world in which the emperor stood as the um, incarnation of God, 
this becomes um, tr uh, transposed into Christ as the uh, metaphysical sovereign who reigns over you know all of reality, the transcendent and the imminent realms. So, um, but it 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 reestablishes the sign economy through the sacraments, through this relationship to you know the mass, um, through symbols. Uh, the, the symbolic economy becomes imbued with a type of, um, um, you know, supernatural metaphysical power with, with Christ as the, the, the guarantor who stands outside of that. So, you know, idolatry in this sense, it becomes uh, re, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a transformation of how idolatry existed in, you know, the old covenant and the new covenant. Yeah. And, um, I think, you know, the Holy Roman Empire is a way in which that could stabilize this new covenant of, of symbols. Um, and, you know, like, like the Parthenon becomes, um, or yes, the Parthenon becomes, you know, the, the right. idols that are there, they become the images of the saints. Um, and, you know, that's something our Protestant friends have take major issue with, but it's a, it's an important critical piece to understanding historical Christianity. Right. And if I could jump in really quick, I kept saying when I was talking to Theo that if reality is historical, hierarchical, and sacramental, then the, the revelation to man would come from Moses, and that the new church would be a continuation of the synagogue economy. It's a completion of it, not the destruction and starting all over. And again, using Rome and the foundation, it's the completion and the universalization, bringing all things under uh, 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 under the sky unto unto Christ in a way that unless this was uh, transcendentally foreordained, it would be impossible to bring all these pieces together in a logical, human and metaphysical order. Um, so once we think about a true block train of authority and revelation, the idol begins and ends, I think, at the point of schism from that um, authority and that order and the rejection that it's transcendental. It's really, did God really say that from the garden? <clears throat> Back to you, Peter. Yeah, just to um, pick up on your point, Will, there about baptizing the pagan world or baptizing those elements which are recuperable, which are salvageable. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this process by which um, Christ became man in a certain sense assumes that which is true, good, and, and beautiful within man into divinity. And uh, I wouldn't endorse all of um, this scholar's writings. Um, uh, Hugo Rana uh, wrote about Greek mythology, uh, and there's a whole number of insights there about how, um, for example, in the Odyssey, the, uh, the boat of Odysseus uh, and the Greeks represents the bark of St. Peter the Church, and that the mast is the cross and Odysseus has to tie himself to the cross to avoid the sirens representing temptation. And there's a whole Christian lens that can be applied uh, to this pagan mythology. And then it can be transcended. The, um, the cunning of Odysseus, the ferocity of Achilles, um, it can be uh, superseded. It can be transcended by... Um, uh, Roland des Sages et Olivier et Prou. Um, sorry, it's the other way around. Roland, Roland is is uh, brave and Olivia is uh, uh, Oliver is wise from the Song of Roland. Uh, so this is the this is Christian uh, uh, knighthood. This is the 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 baptism of the warrior. Um, and so those uh ver those natural virtues or those shadows of the virtues pr present within pagan culture can be assumed into um the 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 life of grace and there is a place for that um so i i think you're you're absolutely right and you've located as you say the uh the fracturing of this order this vision of a, of a if you want to summarize medieval political science you could say it's an attempt to realize saint augustine city of god it's a grand project yes. to concretize that work um and it of course it wasn't perfect but it, in theory um i think the the medieval uh political philosophy is is worth um considering mm -hmm. and there was of course the great idea that 
the Roman Empire, in a certain sense, was coextensive with the church. And this is this is this is instantiated through history with the gradual Christianization of the empire from the Edict of Milan, the toleration of Christianity under Constantine to the Edict of Thessalonica under uh, Emperor Theodosius, where Christianity becomes the official religion of the, the of the Roman Empire. And uh, St. Augustine um, works with the Roman Empire to suppress the Donatists. Um, to the Emperor Justinian, who in his famous legal code actually um, ties Roman citizenship and uh, baptism so tightly together that if people refuse to get their children baptized, they, they forfeit Roman citizenship. So this is absolute identification of, uh, of Rome uh, and the church. Um, even those realms outside the uh let's say this point the eastern roman empire still see themselves in a certain sense as subsidiary um franchise nations of uh the universal authority of the of the emperor um so uh this is something that's taken forward and developed in christ in medieval political philosophy um the the roman empire or the holy roman empire empire as it becomes represents the body the church represents the soul. The Holy Roman Empire represents Christ's sacred humanity. The church represents his divinity. We have the doctrine of the two swords, um, the elaboration of this by Charlemagne, the fact that Charlemagne uh, is crowned by Pope Leo III, that the temporal power receives its authority from the spiritual power, establishes it, sets it up, and judges it when it is not good. We have popes overthrowing emperors when they uh, overstep their authority uh, when they act unjustly. Uh, and so you have this gradual crescendo of the high Middle Ages uh, under the, the power of Rome. So I want to recap a little bit what Peter is telling us, this integration that the um, Christian Imperium was able to accomplish. Um, when we think about citizenship from our sort of imminent American frame, or maybe uh, Amer uh, we'll say uh, Anglo-American frame, um, we're, we're asked very little for this concept of citizenship. In America, if we believe in the spectacle, we can show up every four years or every midterm and participate. That's how we de demonstrate to ourselves in the world that we're citizens of something. Where in Rome, citizenship meant your life. It wasn't something you did. It, you lived it. It was your being. So if you were in service 20 to 25 years in the military, you, you, you participated with your being. So what Theo is getting to, I think, is the way that um, Christ's incarnation and this whole new worldview would able to build off that. So a Christian identity, Christ the logo takes all of the perfected forms into his body when he comes and transcends into our imminent realm. And those were uh, in the minds of our um, the Catholic fathers, um, those were to be instilled into our institutions, into our societies, obviously into our families. So there is this chain, uh, the great chain of being that permeates. So being a Christian isn't something you kind of think about or, you know, now and again have this ascent to. It's perpetually living in motion. And the grandness of that is so hard for us to picture when we've been programmed our whole life that medieval means backwards. In a metaphysical sense, there was something I think spectacular about this order. And that's what we're kind of trying to, to, to tease out and how in that order, when it's translated into a new order of empire, how the new indoctrination, the new teaching kind of takes over you know, biopolitically our bodies, minds and souls. But Peter, please back to you. Well, um, perhaps we can start to look at those connections between the American Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which um, was weakened in the later Middle Ages by the rise of national monarchies, by national particularism, particularly from France, it must be said, but also other nations, um, the decline of the, the, the uh, authority of the emperor and the pope, um, and the, I would say, the end of crusade as well, which was a was a universal Christian effort uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, against the infidel. And instead, we have the scandal of the war among the baptized nations. And some people say that the Protestant Revolution was a, a kind of punishment from God for that scandal. 
uh, where suddenly crusade gets turned in among um, uh, national monarchies. Uh, the French king, for example, declares a crusade against the, uh, the peasants of Flanders, I believe. So we have a, um, a recruitment here, an instrumentalization of uh, religion for political um, objectives, which is the beginning of the subordination of the of religion by uh, politics, the subordination of the spiritual by the temporal. The keynote of modernity uh, begins to percolate, and um, in this time we have this interesting coincidence. This is from Viscount Bryce. He said in AD fourteen fifty three. The capture of Constantinople and extinction of the Eastern Empire, there's one of the iron legs, had dealt a fatal blow to the prestige of tradition and an immemorial name. In AD 1492, there was disclosed a world whither the eagles of all conquering Rome had never winged their flight. The discovery of the new world, the Atlantis, originally by the Habsburgs, under the power of the Habsburgs, we have the Holy Roman Empire as the first temporal power to reach and touch this new world. Uh, the, the true thanksgiving that Americans should celebrate is the first holy sacrifice of the mass, I think in St. Augustine, Florida, um, the, the, the discovery of America by, by Catholics. Um, and at this point, the Holy Roman Empire, I think, uh, like the British um, uh, uh, constitution has matured and established in some senses, what St. Thomas Aquinas believes to be the ideal mixed constitution. That is a, uh, a mixed regime, an Aristotelian mixed regime uh, of both of elements of aristocracy, monarchy, and democracy uh, all at once. Um, in the Holy Roman Empire, you have an incredibly subsidiarist constitutional structure with individual states. Um, it's defined I, as, let me see here, rather than an empire of regions, it's a, a state of states. Sounding familiar perhaps to American uh, listeners. And you had uh, the emperor, of course, his, his authority was um, universal in the sense that he was seen as ruler of the world, uh, or at least universal suzerain, which is slightly different to sovereign, uh, universal sov uh, suzerain, advocate of the church, defender of the church, wielder of the material sword. Ultimately, his role is uh, that of security, to secure, to protect the holy sacrifice of the mass, to make sure that that sacramental economy can be lived by the Christian people. And then you have the uh, imperial diet, uh, the democratic element, and you have the... Um, uh, the the camera gericht, uh, which was the imperial supreme court, which was the aristocratic element, and of course the various principalities, each with their own princes, different constitutions. You had ecclesial states. Um, you even had uh, one state which was at Quidlinburg, which was actually um, a um, how would you describe it? A matriarchal um, ecclesial state uh, that was run by um, the abbess of Quidlinburg. The um, the uh, si the mother superior of the um, female order in that city actually ran the temple states. So you had an incredible uh, uh, tapestry of diverse uh, forms of government under the sovereign of the emperor. And um, there was when Benjamin Franklin was in Europe in the 1760s, um, he made a visit to Germany, um, a trip to the Holy Roman Empire, which. Scholars now are perhaps starting to pay more attention to as of some importance as he sought to learn something about the constitutional structure of this old European body politic. Uh, he planned his, his tour months ahead and he endeavoured to meet a man called Johann Stefan Putter, who was at that time the leading authority on German constitutional law. And it was Putter's understanding of the empire as a federation that attracted Franklin's interest at a, at a time when he was looking for a model for a union of the American colonies. Um, so I, I won't go too much into detail, but I think that there was this Holy Roman moment of the United States, uh, at least with regard to political or constitutional organization, this search for a mixed constitution, 
yes. for um, uh, one in one in many. Uh, the Latin unis it yeah. verbum. That's that's an that's a copy of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so this has been underexplored. Um, we have the copies of his letters to this man Putta. Um, people, for example, uh, I think exaggerate things like the Iroquois influence thesis. Um, but his interest in the federal constitution, the Holy Roman Empire, was at least as serious as his interest in the Iroquois um, uh, uh, Empire, uh, Iroquois Federation. Um, so where am I? Yes, this is the bit I'm looking for. Uh, Franklin was interested in the imperial diet, the comparison with the parliament at Westminster. Um, the German parliaments were parliaments of estates summoned uh, without an election, um, and this is why um, Franklin was uh, was wary of the of the empire as an, um, an essentially monarchical structure lacking the democratic element of the British Constitution. Um, so he's he 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 at least had it under consideration. And in the federal papers, um, federalist uh, papers, I think that the uh, Holy Roman Empire is mentioned something like seventeen times. Um, James Madison. So this is where the imperial temptation is enter entering in. James Madison's critique is that the Holy Roman Empire has two fundamental defects. The first is a lack of effective executive authority in the Federation. Um, the, there is centralized control of a single sovereign, but it's very loose. The principal vassals are too free um, to be able to carry out the manifest destiny, which, which uh, was believed to be the the uh, destiny of the United States um, and too liable to internal squabbling uh, and to jealousies, pride, separate views, pr um, pretensions. And his second critique is a lack of centralized control and effective checks over the member states. So I won't go too much into the detail there, but it's it's interesting to consider. Um, so I think on that very practical constitutional side, you've got um, you've got a resonance. And then also with regard to these, this um, pretension to uh, worldly authority, the, the uh, image of America as the shining city on the hill. So, so in other words, that constitutional, that constitutionalism gets admixed with Puritan eschatology and um, uh, political theology right. uh, to, to, to become the kind of animating spirit, the ethos of the aborning um, American Republic. Yeah, there's so much there. Um, in a moment, I want us to try to see if we can pinpoint a moment because there's this huge continuum when we think the, of a rise of this empire. Um, yeah, what? Well, let's do that now because it's based out there for a moment. When we think of the rise of American empire, where uh, historians can put it many different places, uh, Peter, where would you tend to isolate um, the tendency or the moment at least? For me, uh, like you said, when the other side of the world was discovered, uh, these sweeping pathologies that I'm kind of exploring happen around the conquest, the opening up of the East can, for some people, unlock certain passions. The new world, perpetual aspirations, right? To move to anything can now be possible. The world has become unhinged. And I think in the, uh, the, the American experience, we can talk about, you know, the go West and the Monroe Doctrine. Then we get that development out to California then the railroads are there. For me, what was interested in, there's no more land. That European dream is over, but we can mm -hmm. go up and, <laughs> and then we can become hegemonic powers. But where would you tend to put um, the actual controversial term, the rise of the American empire? Yeah, just before I do, as you say, I think that's, uh, that's uh, quite... Um, uh, perceptive and profound, the fact that California represents that hyper-modernity, that end of the, the terminus of that westward expansion, you can't go any further. And I don't think there's any uh, coincidence there why California is associated with plastic and uh, mass media and entertainment and this hyper-artificial lifestyle. 
Um, the crunch the the, has to be created uh, virtually yes. rather than lived. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so um, I, I believe that that, um, that imperial temptation uh, within the blockchain of becoming is there in kernel form from the from the very uh, beginning of the uh, the American project, uh, the the uh, American proposition ordered liberty with regard to religious indifferentism in the First Amendment. So, so the American proposition, and this is where, of course, debates rage among Catholics um, continuously. Uh, there is something uh, very admirable uh, in the American um, in, in the American Constitution, in particular. Uh, for its uh, prudent balance, its checks and balances, and its, its uh, in a certain sense, esteem of the British mixed regime and the, Mer and the Holy Roman Empire. Um, of course, uh, the Declaration of Independence has much more of an enlightenment flavor and the popular sovereignty, and that's where the egregore is, is present. Um, it's held off, or it's it's there. I, I my my knowledge of the antebellum United States is is not too detailed, but I think that you you have that tension with the populists, with the know nothings, with the anti Masonic parties. Um, but where it really gets formalized, I would say, is with the the American Civil War, which I think um, let's say reifies that constitutional principle, that question: who is sovereign, the states or the federation, and the question gets settled as the federation and we have the beginning of that centralization or, or the at least acceleration of that centralization that madison was talking about there that's uh, extremely perceptive of you to find that moment that's uh, that's deep american politics that you just tapped into <laughs> yeah and so there's always a question mark metaphysically from the beginning it suggested you know the god of nature very shaky 1776, 1789, God is not mentioned except I think it says in the year of our Lord. A scholar brought Protestant named Rush Dooney called it the um, conspiracy in Philadelphia. So the Federalists had always had this idea. And for him, everything beauty could re be restored if we could just return those Puritan confessional states because they realized that mm -hmm. integral element however removed, had to somehow work. So even though they were working within the realm of nominalism, um, the smartest people in the room realized right there. And then when you go, they I, I think essentially metaphysically the can was kicked until after the Civil War and the 14th Amendment. And that's what is a citizen? Are my citizen of Virginia or a citizen of these United States? And the significance of that for the federal project around the world I, I, I would say that's a great, pay, great place. And I went into the rise of the, um, because with that realization that it's federal, now all of the, the true empire where there's gonna be no center, it's boundless, um, becomes possible through Hamilton's idea of, of a commercial empire of sorts. Mm. But that's sort of a Trojan horse. Uh, uh, but um, where would you like to continue, Peter? Well, just, just like you say, a commercial empire, I think that's a great, um a, a great point uh, to continue because uh, e michael jones has observed that um in a certain sense this uh this commercial imperative uh what uh, david wemhoff has called you know uh, uh america was created by the oligarchs for the oligarchs um from the beginning um english a language which is does, is 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 designed to say how much is that and I'll take two. Uh, th this uh, this this kind of commercial heart is, of course, concretized in those terms of the Washington Consensus, which is a, a universalization of the commercial prerogatives across all those uh, different um, territories, those peripheries of the of the American Empire in the 1980s uh, that you explore in that video on the reflections on. Um, U.S. education and how U.S. education does not question the consensus that exists between the two parties, between the two sides of the deep state, uh, the commitment, the shared commitment to the to the terms of the Washington consensus. And I'm 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 submitting that those are parts; those are the the exoteric 
uh, precepts of empire. Yeah. So it's kind of like the operating system of yes. uh, uh, of of this empire, um, and uh, they can kind of seem uh, slightly banal to people. But when you think about it, they are the parameters in which um, not just economic policy, but social policy and uh, ultimately metaphysical priorities uh, take place. Um, so you've got you know fiscal discipline, reorientation of public expenditures. Uh, tax reform. Okay, this is all code for corporate governance. Uh, you know, for privatization, for um, increasing financialization, financial leveraging, asset stripping, uh, control by the hidden powers, financial liberalization. So again, the end of the nation state or the dissolving of the nation state. Will and I have talked about that. Um, quote from Vaclav Havel that the idol of the nation state must inevitably disappear. We're now into this globalist paradigm, uh, which is which is kind of followed on from this American empire. They've been the chief agent of this globalized paradigm. Um, openness to FDI deregulation, opening you up for the the uh, depredations of these uh, these corporations. Um, so. Taken together, these policy prescriptions of the Washington Consensus constitute a package of sin. And they were enforced on various um, um, territories of the American Empire, like the territory that I'm sitting in right now, uh, these, these, these peripheries of the empire. Uh, but I, th I, I think that uh, following again from your reflections, Dr. Haugen, there are esoteric precepts of empire. And I was very impressed by your series of videos where you sought to answer that very simple question. Why is porn free? It doesn't make any sense. If, if we follow the ideologies that we're fed about free market and the profit motive and animal spirits and all these things, why is it that on the most popular uh, pornography websites, not saying that I've been there, but that this is the case, that it's free. Um, there aren't, you know, pop-ups of things are for more porn. Uh, why is it? Because if you think about things in terms of profit and supply and demand, it doesn't make any sense. It's about something else. It's about political control. And this takes us back to St. Augustine. The good man, uh, though a slave, is free, but the wicked man, though a king, is a slave. What is mm. worse, he serves not one man, but as many masters as he has vices. If you want to maintain political control, promote vice. And that's the story of our culture. So these are the esoteric precepts of empire. I've just got a few that I, I record. I'd be interested in your thoughts. Uh, one very important one is a monopoly, because oligarchs are interested in consolidating monopolies, a monopoly of information dissemination, corporate oligarchic media control. Number two, central bank establishment which establishes private creation of the money supply. So we think, I've, you know, I've got money in my pocket with the queen on it. We think that this is a sovereign power, that the, the sovereign creates the money supply. But as Professor Richard Werner has conclusively and empirically proven, private banks create the money supply. So who is sovereign? They then lend that out at interest. And we have the 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 racket of uh, of usury and the the slow concentration of of wealth, um, free porn, as you say, hate speech, stroke anti semitism laws, uh, anti terrorist permanent intelligence agencies, and you can read all about the history of Operation Gladio and how the United Kingdom and the United States yes. played their part in establishing these deep states in the various conquered territories of Western Europe, and then the factory model of education. Um, but what all of these esoteric precepts really concretize are the, are the anti-trinity of sodomy, usury, and idolatry, which Will was referring to earlier. Um, the scholar David Hawkes puts it, uh, usury, sodomy, and idolatry develop, flourish, and recede together because they are dis different aspects of one identical underlying tendency, the usurpation of performative power by systems of representation. End quote. So these, they're these diabolical counterfeits. Usury, or as Zippy Catholic called it, money on the pill, is a counterfeit of creation ex nihilo, a divine power. 
okay. and a diabolical okay. parody of the fecundity of nature and the family. Sodomy is a count which is a much wider category than okay. homosexual activity. It includes contraceptive sex. It includes masturbation. Um, is a counterfeit of the marital embrace and a denial of its fecundity and thus contra naturum. And then most seriously of all, idolatry is a diabolical counterfeit of the worship due to the one true God, the activity of the, the, uh, the unjust latrocini that St. Augustine talked about. So as David Hawke says, the rule of usury, sodomy and idolatry means that we live under the tyranny of the performative sign. Okay. And some of what you're working on is um, helping us identify what this artificial sacramental economy looks like in the metaphysical to tease it out so that maybe we can recognize it and perhaps resist it. Is that is that some of what you're doing is looking at how, because these are uh, metaphysical realities, so they have to be replaced or uh, put other places. Um, and do you think that that is um, been actually institutionalized in the modern world? Well, I, th I, I think... Um, I don't think it was a very good question, actually. No, no, the, Do your own thing with it. Well, I, I think your thinking is maybe more developed than mine in this area, Dr. Hogan, because with, with your, your series, like Why Free Porn, you were looking at how this is, is instantiated in our, in our societies. Um, I mean, some of my research that I've been talking with Will about is the place of sacrifice uh, in in um, in our culture, which touches on the idolatry point. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, I think a my mute. No, um, this idea of the performative sign really is highlighted by that concept of nominalism and nominalism's relationship to idolatry like modern what is modern idolatry you know we have this idea of this neo-pagan um empire in which we're going to be bowing down to pachumama and that's the that's the source of you know modern idolatry but i think it's probably closer to um uh, this aspect of um that, that comes in the protestant reformation william of Ockham, who we mentioned earlier that words create worlds, that words are arbitrary, signs are arbitrary, and it's their performance, that will to power that injects into the sign that actually gives it its, uh, its currency and its meaning, rather than God, uh, who is outside, who's the, uh, you know, the bestower of the generative principle. And so these three, um, this unholy trinity that you described between usury, sodomy, and idolatry is it substitutes the generative principle with sterility. You know, in the case of idolatry, you know, they're dead idols. They're, um, so I, I was listening to this lecture by, um, which I, I think I shared with both of you, uh, by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who's sort of this alt-right um, voice in England, um, similar to like a Jordan Peterson that we have over here, um, who's uh, presenting this idea that uh, words create worlds. Uh, so within the Jewish uh, lexicon, we have you know, commentary upon the commentary is what is what generates meaning rather than it being, you know, once revelation for all time. It's, you know, the the Mishnah comments on the Torah, the Talmud comments on the, the Mishnah and on and on the Kabbalah and then what we have today. So perpetual commentary is this performative sign that um, produces a kind of idolatry. And I think that carries forward into the way that we, you know, imagine the social order presently. And if I can just sneak in real quick, you know, part of what Will and I do in our book, people can talk about Gnosticism, they can talk about Neoplatonism, they can talk about Freemasonism, but these are all masking the messianic election component of creating a date of, of the ruling elite wanting there to be a um, debased population because only from, you know, this is the Sabbatean Frankist credo, that only from that milieu can the messianic uh, being rise. So there, there is a creation of all this, as odd as, you know, uh, uh, utopia through neg negation. Um, and it's been there from the beginning of my research. It clicks with some people, but it doesn't. Why do you want to, you know, why do we want to mention this? Well, if it's part of the story, 
throw it into the mix. <laughs> um, but it all roads lead to this messianistic project. Sometimes it's been grabbed and replaced by the Muslims or the Nazis or the Puritans, but it's there as a type of egregore. It's this messianism that simply got a certain um, demonic ontology attached to it, I would suggest. But yeah, I I'd also say just to make it a little current here, like this Bud Light can. Yeah, I was going to throw that. In. It's a killing of the king. A performative sign, you know, um, and we have this endless speculation within, you know, the media, uh, alternative media about what's the real motivation for this self-sabotage, this self-destruction. I think that speaks to this Sabbatean Frankist um, uh Controlled uh, demolition. Yeah, methodology in which you destroy yourself, you plummet yourself through self-negation. You in, you can enter into the demonic realm in order to resurrect it uh, into this new messianic project. That's what the snake did. That's what the snake did in the garden. He created this so that he could come and build from it. That's right. precisely the lie. And and your five uh, Peter's five principles there. You know the monopoly of information. A dissemination, central bank establishment, um, hate, hate, and anti-Semitism, on and on and on. It's all almost like encapsulated in this one media event around, you know, oh, Bud Light, you know, go woke, go broke, like that meme. It just is so uh, deceptive and misleading because, you know, come to think of it, I think BlackRock owns Coors Light and Miller Light, and you know, all the the competition as well. So. It's a, uh, it's like free porn in a sense. It's, it's, it's a manipulation of consciousness and creating tensions within the spectacle in order to create, to, to regenerate power within the battery, the sterile regeneration yeah. of energy. And Peter, you probably don't want to go here right now, but you know, we've talked about the killing of the King in so many different ways from um, separating the metaphysical connection of Catholic ecclesiology to the metaphysical world to Bud Light that can used to be it was like when I was a teenager, it was like holding the American flag, you know. Yeah, it's like it's like, it's like the Campbell soup. Uh, and, the and, and yeah. And, and, and to then, talk about the a misplaced economy of image where <laughs> where, where where the American Empire, the, the culture is so banal and hollow that the icon is a can of soup. And even that has to be torn down. Absolutely. And through, through repetition and, and, and uh, uh, Will pointed that out a, a while ago. So this can and I, you know, I'm not the macho man, but I'm not going to drink a bud. It's just not my style. It's not my aesthetic. I'm not going to drink a light beer unless there's nothing else in the house. Never have. <laughs> but at any rate, I always thought that there was something kind of cool about just a good old fashioned the flag. You know, I'm feeling kind of. And then you find out it was bought by InBev. So it's not really American and the big uh, horses with the hooves and you know, it's still it's still an image, but it's not real. But we, you know, we process this somehow. And then the can becomes not red, <laughs> the red party, but the blue. So, you know, I could see in my old tavern, the hangouts, all the all the working stiffs, they'd all have to have that blue can. And I just, eh, whatever. But um when we now see in front of our faces military generals walking around in high heels and lipstick, you're mm. getting it in your face. Now, Peter, do you think with the uh, coronation going on, and you don't have to go very long down here, but this is one large killing of the king, so to speak. You know, and even if it's the Savile release, whether that was deliberate or not, and that was probably over a decade ago, this is part of just, it's the, I mean, let me please take it away. What What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> it, it's uh, yeah. I've I've done a number of interviews recently on the the coronation of King Charles the Third, and I think for uh, it's it, again one feels rather conflicted because um, it remains one of the last vestiges of this. Uh, M this constitution of the Roman Empire with all its symbols, with all its um, with all its reflections, with all of the um, the rituals that we have today, the, the the papacy itself has abandoned coronation. The only Christian coronation that still takes place is the coronation of uh, of the King of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And 
albeit that's heretical and and Protestant, uh, but nevertheless, it is derivative and it's 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 saturated with with Catholic imagery and about the uh, uh, and a visualization of of the Catholic understanding of the nature of political authority coming from above. Okay, it's it's this layman, this Protestant layman, larping as uh, a, as a priest, but it's still a, it's 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 a it's a visualization of that. It's an icon of that, and I was struck by um, the most sacral moment of that ceremony, at least historically um, in in its Catholic form, which is the anointing of the king, which is the actual sacramental of uh, the the rite um, and the sacramental. The theology of the sacramental is very interesting because the sacraments are uh, the theology is ex opere operato, whereas the, so the theology of sacramental is ex opere operantis, operating by the imperative virtue of the church. Uh, and so they these sacramentals, um, which, for example, a father has the ability to confer a sacramental by blessing his children, he, he has authority from above over his children uh, to give that sacramental. Um, but sacramentals bestow particular graces, and that sacramental bestows a participation, in the Platonic sense, in the kingship of Christ. Uh, and so at that moment, King Charles, as we had the coronation anthem of Zadok the priest, anoint, uh, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king, He's stripped down to that white chemise. And I couldn't help but think of another King Charles standing on a scaffold uh, in Whitehall, wearing an extra chemise so that he wouldn't shiver before the crowds so that they would think that he was afraid. It was a cold January day. And another king, Louis XVI, wearing a white chemise. And this, this kind of re this. He looked so vulnerable there in Westminster Abbey wearing this white thing. There was something, there's something about that stripping away. And indeed, the medieval uh, king would, act, would be almost divested to just his, his undergarments. Uh, the anointing would be in the crook of his arm and on his chest, um, uh, in between his shoulder blades. So it's very sacramental. It's very, it's very earthy. Um, and I just had an image there of some kind of, there was something so kind of pure uh, and derivative, though it is, but there was something there that the kind of image and icon of Christian kingship that that makes me fear that that is a king that that will be a target of the revolution because it's too powerful. That image uh, for all his faults, for all of his participation, in the Great Reset um, and his his in his environmentalist uh, 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 activism. And all of the platitudes that he he um, you know um, repeats from the the uh, the globalists, I don't know. It was just it just sort of struck me. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not an easy one. Um, I think the idea of putting the monarch over the church was kind of a misplaced category. So how that kind of lines up, um, it, it's, 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 it's strange things, but we're still kind of thinking through our eminent frame, can we still kind of um, apprehend? Um, it, it, um, is it a matter of proper mediation or is, is that door simply closed? So some of those are ideas are out, but I do think there are some connections um, I think a person would be hard pressed to look for anybody on the national or the international stage today that's some bold, strong person with a region. Um, I think maybe the president, I didn't ex <laughs> El Salvador's locking up a bunch of people. That seems to be at least different. But yes, um, at, at any other time, there's always differing parties, but it's so obvious right now that the spectacle that everybody is truly glued together by their um, <clears throat> debased ecstasy, that's part of the spectacle. And I think it is worldwide. It's much bigger than everybody um, walking in lockstep to the mandates. This is truly something that has penetrated our being. And some of the questions we have, and we can get back to education, but do we even have the capacity um, 
to have proper mediation, and I'm not talking about whether or not our, our sacraments are valid, but just the mental capacity somehow. And it, when you go through the rights of the monarch, it makes us think about things like that, or the legitimacy of the Pope. At least we explore the metaphysical placeholder that that, that is. Well, let's talk about education a little bit. Um, I um, I barely remember that video. It was from a couple or a few years ago that I made, um, but I know the ideas, um, the deliberate dumbing down of America. I'm sure I referred to that or Charlotte Isabey and 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 uh, these ideas of uh, the underground um, and the same way Rockefeller sort of took over medicine, they took over um, education, and I was reared in this. Uh, C spot run Dick Jane, you know, just they could see the results were just crashing the mind, but they kept doing it anyway. No child left behind. Everybody hates it. Let's keep doing it anyway. Common core, nobody wants it. Let's keep doing it anyway. So being involved in education now for quite a while, I, just a few quick thoughts. Um, you know, my uh, Dr. Kaczynski teaches, you know, the art of, um, classical thinking and classical learning. And I'm all for that because so much of this Christian nominalism is a result of the anti-intellectual influence of just pulling pulling the metaphysical down to earth. And, and I don't know if they realize they're operating in that realm. So at any rate, just some quick ideas for me with education. Um, I, I did study in, I did a year in England and got um, the tutorial process, which was to me just bizarre. I think I'd like it now, but it was just mm -hmm. bizarre. But I just was not taught critical thinking. My students that come to me are just not taught. I, I mean, it's something you almost, this idea of the trivium and so forth, you almost have to teach yourself in some ways. And I'm pretty sure over in England, the primary schools, or the, which y'all may be called the public schools, are still operating at a pretty high level. In my estimation, even back many years ago, you know, an English education was about equivalent to a four-year college education, a good, a good English education, uh, O levels or A levels, or whatever you call the top one. Um, but I got to tell you, I've been teaching higher education for 20 years, and I just see it the idea, the capacity to critically think. And now it's to the point where the post-pandemic, people don't even feel comfortable doing the face-to-face -face or talking to each other. Everything has been kind of demolished. Um, and the scariest thing, and nobody will talk about this, they bring in these computers, right? And that the size of internet learning has doubled. They have figured out how to make these computers pretty much replace the instructor. If you want to, you can put all your own material. You can interact as, as much as you want to. But everybody's looking the other way. These things can do the class for you. And now we haven't even talked about chat GP or whatever, but you can think about having to grade papers in the, if you're somebody that had to assess critical thinking. So we don't even know where these frontiers are going. Um, and I'd finally ended on this. There is kind of an irony about what Dr. Kaczynski said, because you know more education should be our clue out of this, good classical education, and thinking of things maybe within a perennial or broad tradition to kind of bring things together and be sort of open-minded. Um, but yet, ironically, you know, who called out 9/11 among the the you know classically trained? Very few. I see more plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, car mechanics that seem to understand what's going on then inside of the university. And I'm not even exaggerating. Um, that tops out and that can become Gnostic and that's another story. But um, do you have some reflections, um, personal or otherwise, um, Peter, about the state of education and some of your own experiences either as a student or as an instructor? Yeah, I, I do. Um, before I um, submit those, I would just, just pick up on that, Fred, you said about the, the glue holding us together and how there are these um, increasingly um, uh, ridiculous um, 
killing of the king rituals um uh for the most banal um icons uh whether it's gillette which used to tell us what it means to be a man or it was bud light which used to tell us what it means to be an american man uh at the moment there's this kind of cultural panic about james bond becoming a woman in the united kingdom because he again shows he was the sort of pinnacle of manhood in the era of the nation state and the cold war uh, presenting a very uh, heroic glamorized uh, image of the intelligence agencies a kind of sanitization um media operation for them and uh, suddenly now that icon is under threat and what's going to be the glue which is going to tell us what it means to to be a, a suave british gentleman um, caitlin jenner <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so they, it, but but when you uh, root yourself to to um, lead into education here, when you root yourself in the Western canon, and of course in the faith, then these storms, you're you're cognizant of them, but they're happening across a distant ocean. They they disturb you much less. Um, I think with education, uh, those observations that you you offer. Um, very much uh, echo and correspond to my own observations, what you say about how students just don't read anymore, that they are so loath to uh, to resort to, to touch on what Will was saying about Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs um, lecture on information technologies on, on the, the, uh, on the, uh, the alphabet, uh, script, uh, the, the codex, the printing press, the internet, the codex is is passe now. It's gone. It's a kind of form of like aristocratic knowledge dissemination. It's 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 just not it's not there uh, in their horizon. And you you the evidence is here in England. You you look back at um, uh, working men's associations in the early twentieth century, and they'd be debating the uh, the odyssey or milton's paradise lost and the the intellectual level that they were on was just so much higher than uh than you know uh o oxford and cambridge students today uh so so you're quite right with that observation there was an interesting essay in the imaginative conservative i can't remember the name it's it talking about sacred spaces in education and how the classroom is a kind of sacred space where everything there should bespeak an environment of learning and edification at being at the foot of the master and learning. Uh, you have to put a uniform on, at least in this country. You have mm. to get into that mode. And with Zoom classes, that sacred space just collapses. The, 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 the kid is on their bed in their pyjamas. Uh, they have another tab open with their chats and, and so on. So Absolutely. The, 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 the collapse of the forms, the, the collapse of this Absolutely. order. It's just it's just all part of this grand drama that we're in, which is the decline of Christian yeah. civilization. It's one step out of context, removed from this chain of being. And like, you yeah. know, it's can you imagine being a martial arts instructor and doing it? You you take on it's very interactive and it's it's yeah. almost like an exchange of essence. And there's a quality of uh, learning and love that uh, it's, it's just once removed. Uh, when it becomes yeah. virtual it's that virtual reality and it's that disintegration my i'm 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 visually or virtually present in learning about shakespeare but i'm i'm i'm, I'm physically present in my uh netflix and chill mode uh right it's it's that disconsonance uh between them and you know from the Eliz uh, elizabethan era all the way into the end of the Victorian era, many English homes only had the Bible and Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say in, the, in, in America, this has been tested in the middle of the 19th century. I say this to my students all the time, just blank faces, nothing. <laughs> Look at a newspaper, first of all, from the middle of the 19th century. Look at what the average, and there were only a handful of schools, higher school. Okay, so uh, yeah, the average vocabulary is 50,000 words. That's the size of the entire dictionary. When this information was first um, revealed that someone had done a word count of the diaries and so forth, this was in uh, 1990, and the word uh, and the American vocabulary had shrunk from 50,000 
to 10,000 words. And since then it's below 5,000 right now. So we hold these things and getting somebody off of this, this is a walking, um, this is uh, your television sets probably worse, but I'll call this like free basing the spectacle right here. So you can get anything you want, um, good or bad. And you can, to, to have somebody just put this down without doing this constantly, but can you get a person to kind of hear a piece of information and then Google and see and compare? And I know nowadays the algorithms are so messed up, but yes, the critical capacity and something I'll say about the era that I was kind of growing up in, it, there was kind of this, oh, funky anti-Vietnam, anti-establishment kind of thing. So it was a little bit cool to question authority. That's over. The left are signed on to pharma, signed on to the military industrial complex, signed on to the, mem and you ask them what they're about now, I don't even know because I don't talk to them, honestly. They're all around me. I, I, I can only imagine. But like what this thing, who goes to whose bathroom, that's where you're going to put your flag on who you are and what you stand for and everything else is gone. <laughs> that was what was so shocking about the pseudo pandemic, the, the millennial and Zuma response, the response of youth enforced mm -hmm. by the baby boomers. If that had been, happened in their time, they would have gone crazy. You know, can you imagine uh, locking us up in our home for six months, uh, not allowing us to go to parties and and uh, you know uh, uh, and and all the activities they were up to, music concerts and so on? Uh, but the Zoomers just uh, placidly accepted this tyranny uh, in a way that I would just found shocking. Uh, how kind of zombie-like uh, they were, and and, and the, sometimes their zeal in enforcing uh, the uh, various. Uh, parts of the of this very superstitions of 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 that uh, period. Uh, there's something so kind of wrong. Uh, this touches on so many things. Um, my friend Dr. Jesse Russell talks about this postmodern exhaustion, this kind of late civilizational ennui, this loss of of uh, thumos, uh, this energy which is which is meant to be the characteristic of youth, that drive. Youth is yeah. not meant for hedonism; it's meant for heroism. The youth have the 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 energy to go and be a conquistador, to be a crusader, to go and be a missionary on the other side of the world. That's what the gift of youth is for. And it's been so inverted now, where they are just the they they are the the so idle uh, in in their um, activity on social media uh, and the whole inversion of 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 reality, where they don't take part in things. For their own, I'm generalizing here, of course, yes. but for its own sake, but it's it's for the economy of the image. It's for the curation of their social media Absolutely. profile. Uh, That's and a good and as, you, as you point out in there, in, in that reflections video, uh, you, you point out some of these 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 puzzles, uh, these of, of our political system, you know, the the incumbency puzzle, for example, that you pose to them. Uh, not Nothing too threatening, you know, nothing about uh, freemasons or anything too spicy and 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 they just they're just not they just don't engage it's just it's i want to go back to the spectacle i want to go back to yeah. the spectacle so we've been biologic uh biopolitically programmed yeah. and, uh, and so you know this is from foucault it's from the idea of the the uh, empire of spectacle the glue so there's this this is i think what connects maybe all of our conversations today it's as if there is this um Overton window, you know, to use our term, whether it's education or your own citizenship, um, that you have to look through this and it's a control grid. And um, when we look through, you know, we'll call it the great chain of being, the blockchain of being, it's a total revelation. And the part that's not filled in, that's where the trouble is, that state of exception, the thing that's precisely what needs to be talking about to make a whole person, to make a whole society, to keep the uh, um, cosmic order together. So as long as that can't be discussed, as long as that window, and that's where you can get into the state of exception and who decides what's in that window. But that window, what you can and cannot say, the rules are pretty similar around the world now. Um, and, um, in college discussions, you can only, you know, how far can it really go? Um, you can hopefully still teach the art of critical thinking. Um, 
and maybe people can understand to the extent that maybe people can identify propaganda in advertisements and so forth at this real mm -hmm. basic level. Um, and I, I suppose my sort of almost concluding thoughts today, you know, I once heard, a, you know, sort of a Protestant banging at a strip mall church kind of guy, <laughs> but he would say, he said, you know, the, the Bible makes you smarter. So wherever you are in life, I believe the Bible will just, it, it helps make you small, smarter, opens up some of the metaphysical horizons around you. And I believe that the traditional sacramental hierarchical order will take you to a whole nother level. And to me, education's got to be about, you just want to do it. It's exciting about to do it. You, your growth, your, and it brings you closer to your creator. And once you tie learning and even the pain of learning back to what you're truly meant to be, which is somebody in God's service, every part can fit together. Now in an idealized world of the Imperium, all these seemingly from our perspective, look backwards, metaphysically hooked in. As uh, Rene Jard would say, every period is the best of times and the worst of times. So we have to kind of be mindful of how we look back and what we can do with that to look forward. But there's, you know, that's the magical ingredient. How do you just make somebody want to get excited? There's all kinds of videos about being the best you you can be and get up in the morning. And that's all aspirational to show your neighbor what you've done or to even prove to yourself what you've done. But that's the sleight of hand and the demon, not only in our democracy, but in our in our social milieu. But we can't separate how our best life um, isn't worth a thing. You can't put that at the end of your life. You can't put that before Christ unless it was done for him, through him. Um, and it's all about him. Then that death self you is the best that's you submitting your will to who Christ designed you to be. And so we open up to the forms the same way we open up to the message of, that Christ has for ourselves individually, for our collectives, and where are we in this cosmos? And back to you know the Bible banging Protestant, scripture does give us a great direction for all of these things, but scripture itself without being buttressed by the history is a, is we've inherited something uh, the the Protestant Bible and our and our modern liberal economy, our secular economy, is is missing at least an openness to what that transcendent frame was. How it the the whole economy of reality itself as an ontological class includes us somehow managing what Desmond would call the art of the between. And how do you do that? I would say meditation, scripture openness, just a desire, a love for um, for God. And I think that's got to be the starting point. And through and with his grace, um, we cooperate and we move forward to make through, through God's image of us, our best selves and the best world um, that we can. Um, I don't want to leave you out too much. Well, I feel like you're being a little too quiet back there. You have any closing thoughts? And we don't have to shut it up. I'm just, those are my kind of final thoughts. Yeah, in prayer, you know, um, give the rosary a chance if you haven't already. I think that's uh, been such a revelation in my spiritual life. Uh, Get over that you're too intelligent, that this is something for dumb peasants. That's what's killing right. the world. You're, right. you're, you're, get over yourself. <laughs> You know, you you need the, the rosary if you're when you're really to fight to be the best you, you're not really in the game if you're not you're not grabbing on to that thing. That's the best you you can be. We we want to be ourselves as unblemished as we can to participate in a church that's designed to be unblemished, the bride of Christ. Yeah, and 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 also I want to say along the lines of you know, solo scripture. Uh, the Bible taken out of its context without the um, authority of the church to, to help us read it and interpret it and understand the typologies, understand the eschatology, it becomes an idol. It becomes something out of context and it becomes easily misplaced and, and wrapped into the egregore and uh, turned into po a political theology that ends up uh, do, doing the opposite of its intention. So that's something that has to be resolved uh, for our Protestant viewers out there. Yeah, and I'm sure um, uh, 
Peter, as a cradle Catholic, you're a little more sensitive about taking those pokes. But I, Will and I talk about that, that the, it, it's, you know, Protestants going to bulk, but it can be mm. a, a, the scripture can be, it's out of context and it's tricky, but it can become anything you want it to be, including an idol. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a different um, cultural context over there because Protestantism is still a, a social force. In, in your society, whereas where I am, it just it's gone pretty much. So, um, it, it's just, oh really? It's just, you mean similar. the Bible Belt kind of thing is just not there anymore? There's no. There, there are some, uh, but they, it's so. Yeah, there is there is evangelicalism, um, and the the Church of England is there, but it's it's so dry and empty now, uh, but. I, I feel like I just, I feel like I'm kind of bashing on this, you know, and I will say this about America, like, I like the Bible Belt, I like the Deep South, I, I do, you know, it's the, it's two worlds, and I'm taking, mm -hmm. I'm being a bit critical, but there is a lot of sincerity and, and reality to that, to that world, too. And to me, when I get, I haven't been to Europe for a long time, but parts of America where that's not alive, I feel the coldness in the air. Mm. And I imagine that um, I, well, I, Europe just strikes me as um, cold in that regard. Yes, uh, I think in a certain sense, there's more, in a certain sense, more Christian vitality in the United States. Um, it's interesting how prominent place in the tra Catholic traditional revival the United States is. Um, but you don't have the... Um, the forms political and cultural forms of christendom to work with whereas with us it's slightly like opposite we have the advantage of the cultural and political forms uh but we don't have the uh same kind of vitality perhaps if, if, if talking very broad strokes uh but i think i would in terms of remedies like to point to um, an educational issues uh, and great Cath american catholic who has really helped me think correctly about education uh, and even begin to systematize some sort of response to this um, alongside Stratford Caldecott, and that is um, uh, John Senior, uh, who is a great educator. And I keep coming back to this quote of his. He said, no serious restitution of society or the church can occur without a return to the first principles. Yes. But before principles, we must return to the ordinary reality which feeds the first principles. And so this is this informs his educational vision where um, the first stage of education for young children, but there's no reason why it can't be done older, is what he calls the gymnastic stage of education. Uh, from, the, from the Greek gymnos meaning naked, uh, by that meaning naked contact with reality. Uh, he would always say the real is really real. This is platonic realism. Uh, this is the the uh, metaphysical, you know, foundation of of a Christian worldview. Uh, and so uh, that's what these students are lacking. First of all, that gymnastic stage, if they've yeah. been latchkey children, if they've been uh, involved with the, you know, glued to the society of the spectacle, not uh, poking their toes into running streams and making mud pies and uh and 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 loving the 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 flowers the names of yes. the flowers and so on uh so the gymnastic stage is first that's followed by the poetic stage and this is or sorry the musical stage which is musical in the broad sense the nine muses one of which is poetry another is uh is um uh historic uh is is history uh or the history of great men um and uh another one is music itself um and the poetic stage, again, this is all pre-evangelization in a certain sense. So the poetic stage is about um, taking, um, well, he says the gymnastic stage begins in sensation and ends in delight. Uh, and the poetic stage uh, take, uh, begins in delight and ends in wonder. So it's about provoking wonder. Uh, which uh, Aristotle obviously famously says is the beginning of of philosophy, um, and then yes. then that, yeah, and then the poetic stage then can lead to the liberal arts, uh, which is an education in wisdom, 
So it begins in in wonder and ends in wisdom. And then as Catholics, we of course that would be paralleled with catechesis, which you know begins in wisdom and ends in uh, faith, hope, and charity. These three. So uh, what what's needed is is a pre political, cultural or pre cultural, which is to reconstitute the conditions for human flourishing, uh, which is both positive and negative. He has a famous essay about throwing out the TV. Uh, today, he'd say, throw away the smartphone, um, you know, throw away your social media. And I know, you know, we're having this conversation on the internet and so on. It has to be used virtuously and in moderation. Uh, but uh, he has the prescriptions there. I think he has the right idea with education. Um, when he was professor of the Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas, he had over 400 students convert, and he never once, uh, at least in his classes, mentioned, um, uh, gave a, a kerygma, an announcement of the gospel. Uh, he just studied uh, the Western canon and grounded them in um, a pre culture, a pre Christian cultural matrix uh, of the great works. And his students would do things like go stargazing and dance the waltz and go horse riding and these sort of things. Uh, so I think I think that's what what young people need first. Uh, they need the smartphones taken away. They need to rediscover Absolutely. the polarity, the beautiful complementarity of men and women uh, to to then be ready to receive that seed uh, of the gospel. So pre evangelization, tilling the soil. That was beautiful what you just said. Um, and I think there's some kind of renaissance in America for a number of reasons. Uh, 20 years ago, it was kind of taboo to have one of these Christian software at home kind of things, but that's just exploded. And a lot of that is about getting out, you know, kind of being like a Boy Scout, getting your hands dirty, look at the ants, all that stuff's great. And yeah, when we, on top of this, when our mimetic desires are either going to be pulled up by our world or, or down. So, you know, if one could, they have to put individuals in a place where they can flourish, what you're saying. So the immediate physical environment matters a great deal. And I, I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't, you know, we're never going to go backwards. I just don't have a lot of hope for, for, for humanity, whether this goes inside of us or stays constantly in our, in our sweaty palms. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's not reality. It's it's pretending to be it's masking reality um, and it, it's it's the deepest <clears throat> and we know it. I mean, even people addicted know it at some level. Yeah, um, yeah I, I really liked what you said. And um, if it is the case that this uh, attempt to make a new order, um, they, they, they go scorched earth and people do it. This is not God's timing. People will have to recreate communities somehow. And so um, you've explored that and thinking about alternative communities. I've thought a bit about it. Like, uh, is there any chance that at least some micro level we could return a world where Christ is truly sovereign over at least a specific physical boundary? Um, and I don't wanna be so pessimistic. And I don't even want to end this, uh, end this podcast, you know, on a note of, of pessimism. Um, because I think uh, Gerard's words are important that when we're trying to have a perspective on the past, the future, or where we are, I know in many ways in my own life, I can't, I literally can't watch the news. I, I just don't want to hear about it. But yet, um, as Dickens was it Dickens? These are the best of times. These are the worst of times. Um, and the idea of the art of the in-between, um, riding between the secular and the religious, the transcendent, the transcendent and the metaphysical is the ride that we're on. And it is so easy for us personally to uh, become derailed. Uh, well, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I think we're wrapping up here unless uh, anyone else has any final thoughts. Peter, will you, do you want to sound off with anything or any, any closing ideas? No, just thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me on your podcast. Uh, as you say there, Dr. Haugen, we are in the story. Um, and that's something that we can lose track of with this sort of 
strange kind of timelessness of the virtual world but uh from all eternity god uh you know ordained that we would live in this time as the best time to save mm. our souls hopefully influence the salvation of the souls around us uh and so you know it is it is the best time to be alive in that sense and that's what i always uh, say to people where, where people are bemoaning uh, the um, period of uh, dissolution and collapse uh, that we are in, um, it's a great time to be alive. I think we need to be prepared to go into the darkness. And if this is part of the passion of the church, there's very little said about this, but what I'm getting a sense of, it's sort of a retransfigured mission of what you're doing, Vende. Uh, on Vende is it's 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 really the church militant that's going to walk to the cross, I believe. And mm. it's hard to get your head around that. But um, we're not conquering the East. We're not expelling the Moors from um, Spain this time. But we're going to be um, willing to take the slings and arrows of uh, people that we wouldn't even expect would have hurled them toward us. Mm. Um, and I think that is especially why I value what you're doing at Vende, because I think you take that burden on and um, you take it on boldly. So I really appreciate that about what you do over there. Thank you very much. Yeah, you've given me much to ponder and I hope we can continue our conversation soon. Excellent. It's been great having you on. So many ideas. Um, but um, we're going to sign off right now. Um, Willard in Kentucky, it's nice chatting. I wish you could have jumped on a little bit more, um, but we are going to sign out and we are going to say goodbye to our guest today, Peter. It's been uh, just a joy having you on. Thank you very much. God bless. And everybody in deep, deep state land, thank you for listening. <laughs>